Welcome to Book Me Podcast, sponsored by Nimbus Publishing. I'm Lindsay Glode Rainingbird. Join me as we journey through contemporary Canadian literature, reading as much as we can and chatting with authors, illustrators, and other bookish folk, celebrating our dynamic, diverse, and vibrant national literary scene as we go. So grab a snack, get cozy, break that binding, dog ear those pages, let's dig into it. Today we're joined by Becca Babcock, whose new novel, Some There Are Fearless, explores how a rough childhood and fixation on nuclear disaster shapes a woman's life. The things she loses and the person she becomes when she's responsible for keeping the world safe at work, yet everything is falling apart at home. This book is as vulnerable and intimate as it is tense and yearning, and I truly enjoy delving into the world of a flawed woman in STEM, just trying so hard to hold on to control. I think you all will too. Welcome to the podcast, Becca. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. So this is your second novel, first being one who has been here before, and it's completely different. It's more of a gothic feel. So can you just tell me a little bit about how this book came to be? Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know if you all remember, but a few years ago, there was a really great mini series on Chernobyl. I was watching it and it made me remember what it really was like to grow up um, in Cold Lake, which I did. And after watching the miniseries, I called my best friend. We, she and I grew up together and we talked about how strange it was, like the, the things that were just so normal growing up in the Cold War on a military base. And we talked about, you know, how, how we never even thought about sort of pausing mid-conversation because an F-18 was blasting its engines and, and like everybody in town had to just stop talking and then continue and we, we had this great conversation about all of these things that were honestly just so terrifying and bizarre. And, and that was normal for us. That, that was how we grew up. And so I, I started thinking about maybe the ways that we, we might not have noticed that that shaped us and how, how maybe it might have shaped someone else differently. And, and I wanted to write that book. And um, my, my brother is uh, an engineer and he was working um, in nuclear power at the time. And so you know, I, I was calling him and we were talking and, and you know, really thinking through those ideas and, and what it might mean to really consider the type of childhood that we had and how that might shape the world we want to live in. Which is a lot like the way the world that kids around now are growing up in and having to do all these different kind of emergency shooting protocols and stuff, something that you would never think a child should have to go through. Very similar to that type of growing up situation in the Cold War. Yeah, we had a dinner time talk the other day. My kids are, are six and five and, and they had to do these terrible lockdown drills and escape from a bus drills. And, you know, it was just really exciting for them. And, and we talked to them about the different types of, of bomb drills that we used to do at school, you know, the ones in school or the ones where sometimes we would have to go across the road into the bomb shelter in the basement of the church. And, you know, we were talking about the different types of drills. And it's funny because I, I think there was a time in between my childhood and theirs where, where kids didn't have that. You know, kids didn't have these emergency drill situations, this emergency preparedness in their lives. And it's it's kind of heartbreaking because a lot of what, what happened in my childhood that we'd moved past my kids are going through something similar. Yeah, and you'll, we're not going to see what that's going to be like until years and years from now. No, it's true. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they'll write weird books when they grow up. Well, hopefully. Hopefully they do. So how much research went into this? Because you talk so much in, in like engineering speak in the book, and that was something that I wasn't sure that I would be into. But the way you do it makes it just really interesting and fascinating and I was surprised by how into engineering I became by the end of this book. So how did you manage to do that? Uh, that's my brother. Um, he, he lives in New Zealand right now and so you know a lot of the way we communicate is, is we you know through Facebook Messenger either messages or recorded videos and so I would send him a crap ton of questions and he would just walk around his house you know holding his phone like with the video on just talking me through the answers and and so I have like all of these hours and hours and hours of footage um, of, of my brother explaining to me how stuff works. And so thank you, Fidit. Um, but it's like the great thing about being a writer is that, you know, you, you tend, if you're, if you're very fortunate as I am, you've got all these people who are, are willing to help you. Um, a Facebook memory came back the other day 
um, you know, where, where I, I jokingly, you know, thanked everyone in my life who was willing me to willing to help me kill off a fictional character. And, you know, I was joking, it takes a village to kill a character. And, you know, I'm just, I'm so fortunate. You know, I've, I've got doctors in my life, um, you know, hey, Melanie, thank you for helping me make the kids sick in this book. And, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Phil, my, my aunt's partner, um, a different Phil, um, you know, willing to help me with medical stuff. And then my brother willing to help me with that. And then later on down the road, you know, I, I did some Google searches and I'm fortunate to have access to the, you know, Dell library system. And so I was trying to understand some of the basics of of physics um, on my own, but I wasn't super confident. Um, so I was emailing, you know, faculty members at local universities who were, you know, very willing to help me out. And so I, I was just really, really lucky to have this excellent network of um, smart people, chief among them, um, my brother. I feel like people would get excited to be asked to kind of collaborate or help with research on a book and just be like, oh, those are my my ideas that are kind of showing up in there. That's neat. I hope so, because I, I only paid them in a free book. So. <laughs> you're like, thank you so much. <laughs> and so partway through the book, your character, Jessica, and her partner, I call him the criminally underwhelming Adam. Uh, <laughs> he's not that bad, but just feels like he just never does enough. Um, anyway, they go traveling to Ukraine and throughout Europe. And so I was just wondering if that was something that you had done. Did you actually go visit the nuclear accident no, spot? No, I, I, I'd never been that far um, east in Europe, um, sadly. Um, again, my brother did go, and, and you know, he was telling me about some of his experiences. Um, but I most of this book I wrote um, well before um, Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, but that bit, the, that bit of their trip to Europe, I wrote, um, I, I wrote after the invasion. And so I was doing this heartbreaking thing where I was using, um, you know, Google Street View to, to walk around where they would go and see and based, you know, partly on, on, you know, things my brother told me about visiting Ukraine. Um, and it was just, it was just such, such a heartbreaking experience to be looking at these places and knowing that, you know, many of them are, are, are catastrophically changed now. So yeah, that was relying on Google Street View in a time when the images on Google Street View are, are, are radically and catastrophically different. Well, you did an amazing job of building it then, because I thought for sure you had to have actually been there and you had to have experienced that, <laughs> just visiting, going through all the checkpoints and seeing what it was like. Yeah, yeah no, that was primarily that. And then um, I have I have some friends um, who are from Ukraine, um, Lubov and Ser Sergi, and, uh, you know, talking to them and to Lubov's dad, um, realizing how different the experience of being Ukrainian Canadian is, as opposed to actually being Ukrainian. And so, you know, I talked about the food and stuff, and that was based on my conversations with Lubov and realizing that the type of foods that I grew up eating and being told these are Ukrainian foods, those are not the type of foods that she grew up eating living in Kiev. So, you know, there, there's there's that too, being able to reach out and 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 ask and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. Part of this book, or a big part of this book, is about mothering and how you treat your children, That, like what that does to yourself as well. Um, and I was curious about her relationship with her own mother, which is very tense and very volatile, and at times I'd say probably abusive. Um, what that was like writing it, and then how you think her relationship with her own mother shaped her as a character and shaped how she became a mother, if you have thoughts. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's it's those of us who do grow up with our mothers for better and for worse. We are we are so shaped by that. Um, I one of my favorite lines from Ted Lasso is when Ted meets Rebecca's mom and says he loves meeting moms because there's something like a roadmap as to why people are crazy. And it's true. Oh, my gosh. And for it's better so true. Worse. <laughs> and um, I, I had... Uh, not long before I wrote this book, I had read um, Elena Ferrante's uh, Neapolitan novels, and I I was just enamored with the way that Ferrante writes the prickliness of love, um, you know, and, and the ways in which we we sort of inherit this prickliness and pass it down, and and, and yeah, the the complexities of of love. So 
Yeah, that, that's definitely something that I was thinking about. Um, you know, I, I I was thinking about my kids, too. I, I became a mom um, relatively late in life. I, I was in my late 30s. And thinking about what a terrible mom I would have been when I was younger. I was um, angry and judgmental and quick-tempered. And, you know, if, if I'd had... If I'd had kids in my 20s or even my early 30s, I think as a mom, I would have been a lot like Jessica's mom. You know, that I would not have been a great parent. And just thinking about the grace in my life that I was allowed to become a better and more patient person. Not that I'm a perfect mom by no means, but <laughs> uh, I'm a better mom than I would have been. So uh, a lot of that was an imagination of, of you know, what if I had had kids younger? What what would that have turned out like? And probably not great. I feel like we have that capacity in all of us to be the worst version of a mother that we could be and then also the most ideal version. And I feel like you did a great job in this book with Jessica of showing the mother that she yearns to be and wants to be and just can't quite get there. And I felt like that was just super relatable. Yeah. You know, again, I, I, I try. I do my best. But there are moments with my kids where I'm like, oh, my God, you are scarring them. You're ruining them. Why did you do that? <laughs> and yeah, I, I, I guess I wanted to capture some of that, too. <laughs> and then they wake up the next day and everything is brand new and everything's forgotten. Everything forgotten. I hope so. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully. We'll, we'll see. If they become writers, we'll see what kind of books they write and we'll know how much is forgotten. <laughs> the other thing I loved about motherhood in your book is how you kind of relate nuclear energy to motherhood. And it's like that is just so much what we do every day, especially I think as young mothers, is just trying to mitigate disaster in your children's lives just constantly and just hoping that it goes okay that one day. So I don't know, was that an intentional kind of... That's something that came later because after a first draft, after a first draft of the book was done was when I started trying to understand um, really physics and nuclear physics. And, you know, there there's this great lecturer from India online who who explains, um, you know, transient equilibrium. And there's there's a paper that I read and, and that's a connection that I, I discovered, you know, in my early revisions and, and started you know, rebuilding parts of the novel around those concepts. But, you know, that, that realization was, um, yeah, it was sort of a pivot point in, in, in the development of the, the story. Nice. I guess that's really interesting how you might start out the novel one way and then it completely turns into something different as you're going through the editing process. Was there anything like big that you ended up completely changing or yeah. getting rid of? Yeah, there's this whole sequence um, in in Toronto where um, Jessica discovers, you know, she, she sees herself as imperiled. She is aware of, of the degree to which she's at risk, um, you know, in general, but also as a woman. Um, and, and so there was this whole sequence in, in Toronto when she really discovers her privilege, um, you know, by because of her, her friendship with, you know, the, these people who become her family, you know, a black woman and a trans woman. And there was this whole sequence where she discovers her relative privilege. And, you know, I, I'd initially talked about it with my editor who said that it seemed, you know, heavy handed and, and I was really committed to to keeping it and then you know like it, it just sort of went with like a series of other scenes that weren't necessary and I didn't notice until the very end and then I felt this moment of panic and I'm like no that needs to be in there and and I just sort of had to let it go like you just I I teach creative writing and I talk to my students all the time about Hemingway's um, iceberg theory you know what I mean where where most of what is in a novel is is under the water the, the readers never get to read it but if you know it's there it's it's going to make that iceberg float, you know what I mean? So I, I guess I just had to trust that having written it and then cut it, it was in there. <laughs> no, it definitely was in there. I think her relationship and friendship with Laura was one of the brightest points in the book for me. I absolutely loved the character of Laura. She's just like so warm. Like I just saw her as this golden light in her life. And it made me really happy that there was nothing that she overtly experienced that was super racist or problematic. You knew it was all under there, especially 
in her re- her interactions with her father, with Laura's father, um, and his kind of worries about what they might get up to. And, you know, you can't go hang out at the mall. You can't. The, the other girls can, but you can't. That sort of thing. There was definitely just under the surface so much. And I think I think it definitely comes across. I think it does. I'm glad. Yeah, it was a worry. I just, you think a lot about your position in the world. And then when you create a character, you think about their position in the world. And you hope that if, you know, if if you are a reasonable citizen, you are also thinking about other people's position in the world. And so, you know, I, I, I wanted, um, I wanted there to be times when Jessica was and was not able to think about other people's position in the world too. And I think you did that amazingly. I just really also just loved how many different types of people and characters that you managed to put in your book. And it didn't feel heavy handed to me at all. It felt like, yes, this is the world that we're in. It's diverse. There's so many different people and the ways that people might change or hurt you in your life. It it's never predictable, you know. And that's okay. Yeah, I mean, it's that that is it, right? I mean, we're we're all main characters in our own lives, but um, you know, so is everybody else. And and you realize that when when things change, and yeah, you, you're the main character in your own life, but you're not the main character in anyone else's. And you should know that, and <laughs> you should be okay with that. <laughs> what I felt at at its heart, this book was about, in some ways, was control and how it shapes our lives and how tenuous it is and the ways that what we give up when we need to have it, what we have to sacrifice to have control. So I was kind of curious how you felt that worked throughout the book and what you might hope that Jessica and readers as an extension might learn about control or think about control by the end of it. Oh man, I have a story. <laughs> oh yeah, a yeah, story. So um, there, there's a scene um, towards the end of the book without giving away too much where um, Jessica feels very out of control. And so she does something kind of irrational just as a way of, of trying to gain control over something else in her life. And, and she goes to a power plant that she's working on and, you know, it, it's it's not a rational choice, but there's something else that she's totally lost control of and, and that feeling of she needs to do something to feel powerful. And so she does this thing and then, you know, someone else comes and intervenes with love. Um, and that scene, it just, it, it took so long and I, I rewrote it so many times and I handed in a draft and not even realizing that one of the drafts that I sent in to, to my editor here at Vagrant, um, sorry, Whitney, was like, instead of actually writing that scene, I had like big yellow highlighted script, rewrite scene here. And <laughs> and her note to me was, yeah, you probably should rewrite that scene here. <laughs> and I, I knew that something had to happen and I was just not finding what had to happen there. And so I, I drafted one scene with another character and it wasn't right. And I drafted another scene with the proper character and I knew it wasn't right. And so finally Whitney stepped in and she's like, okay, here's what I think needs to happen here. And she was absolutely right. And and she and I basically co-wrote that scene. So thank you, Whitney. <laughs> um, but you know, it in a, it's it's I don't know, it's 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 a meta moment because a, a scene that is about accepting that you do not have control. And as a writer, I had to accept that I didn't have to control. I, I had to give control over to my editor to help me get where it needed to be. So, I mean, that was kind of a beautiful moment where the act of writing the book um, really just mirrored what was going on in the book. Yeah. And the scene you're talking about, the character that comes to kind of help her and push her into maybe a little bit more of reality is somebody who has heard her. And so there's this extra element of just not knowing if you can take the advice or take the love because you have so much hurt that's sort of filling the spot that might hold that love. And I thought it was just a really beautiful way to show that the things you have to let go to let the love in. Like, I just love that scene. I know exactly which one you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, there's some stuff that's hard to forgive. But, um, you know, if if we can, you know, sometimes it's it's really about um, giving ourselves permission to have more and not less. Exactly. I'm I'm a firm grudge holder. So I'm learning that every day that 
forgiving, letting go of things is actually what's going to bring you joy in your life. Holding on to that is going to hurt no one except yourself. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I tend to hold grudges too. I, I'm still mad at a guy who bullied my little brother in elementary school. And they have, you know, reconciled years ago. My brother told me that, like, this guy came up to my brother and apologized and remembered that when we were li really little, we all used to play together. I'm like, well, that's great for you that you forgave him. I'm, I'm still, <laughs> I, he's, he's on my forever hate list. I don't even care. I will side eye that guy so hard for the rest of his life for the thing he said to you in grade two. Yep. <laughs> I'm the same. So maybe I just want to know now, what are you reading or what? sort of books have been sticking with you? Oh, yeah. Um, so I I have been reading the books of all the folks who really generously, um, you know, gave some editorial reviews for mine. Um, you know, Shelley Butler Hallett's um, Constant Nobody has just been haunting me. Um, you know, Atomic Anna as well. Um, I finally picked up a copy of um, Crow that's been sitting on my desk for a while. So, you know, I, a lot of Atlantic fiction lately. Um, and, and yeah, I've just, I, I've been, um, really loving the folks who, who blurbed me. Um, if you haven't read, um, yeah, if you haven't read these books, you definitely should. Um, Charlene Carr's, um, book, Hold My Girl, too, is incredible. And I can't wait for that movie. <laughs> I can't believe it's already been made into a movie that's so good. I read that book as well and loved it. I just thought she did such a cool job of making you root for one character and then the next. And they're kind yes. of going against each other in a court case. But you keep going back and forth to being, who do I think? I think they should both. Oh, ah, yeah, ah, yeah, ah. It's, it's, it's so complicated. <laughs> um, in my creative writing classes, I've had Catherine Banks come in and give talks about playwriting. And she tells students that some of the best conflicts are, are you know, a, a fight between two goods, not between good and evil. And that book is just is such a great example of a fight between two goods. And yeah, it's a reminder that that is a great conflict to, to put into to writing. Definitely. I feel like that's even a little bit coming back to your book. What's in her partnership with Adam is that neither of them are necessarily at in the wrong, but the way they interact just makes you go back and forth. Like, of course, you shouldn't talk to him like that. Of course, she should do this. Of course, he should do that. But it, in the end, they're both they're both fine. They just yeah. don't do well together so much. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to, to write a relationship that was really important for both of them in terms of their growth, but also was somehow both really healthy and also a disaster for both of them at the same time. I love that. That's my favorite type of relationship to read. So you have a excerpt that you'll be reading for us. I do, sure. Give the people a little taste of what to expect. Okay, so I'm going to read an excerpt. Um, it's it's early in in what I think is sort of the the central relationship in this book, and that's the friendship between um, Jessica and her best friend Laura. And uh, Laura's family has has come over to dinner to Jessica's house, and you know they're talking, and um, you know there's a the question: What are you going to be when you grow up? And so I, I'm going to read um, sort of that answer, and then what that question um, brings up um, for Jessica. I looked back to Mom. She was smiling again. This time it was her real smile, softer, not forced. Jessica wants to be an engineer when she grows up. Laura's dad looked at me, his eyebrows raised in an exaggerated way that adults do when they want children to know they're impressed. Do you? Yes, I said. In truth, Mom had suggested it to me, and I'd never really considered the matter one way or another. She'd brought home a big, hardcover book from the school book fair. It was called What Will I Be? On the cover, there were drawings of a yellow-haired little boy dressed as a doctor with a stethoscope, a firefighter, a police officer, and a scientist with a bubbling test tube. In the book, the boy tells a bunch of different stories, each starting with I will be a... I will be a lawyer. I will be a carpenter. I will be a teacher. I will be an engineer. Mom had sat on the couch and beckoned me over. We'd read several chapters together, and when we got to I Will Be an Engineer, Mom had put her arm around my shoulder and squeezed me tightly to her. You can be an engineer, she said. You're smart enough, and you can be anything you want. I'd rested my head against her shoulder and nodded, looking at the picture of the smiling boy designing a suspension bridge in a city studded with skyscrapers and puffy green trees. A few years later, I would say the words aloud for the first time, I'm going to be an engineer. I was in grade eight then. In September, the guidance counselor, Mr. Desjardins, came into our classroom. He handed out a booklet to, for us to fill out, an aptitude test. 
I filled in the bubbles on the test sheet, feeling a bit uneasy about a test that didn't have right or wrong answers. The following week, while we all worked on assignments in class, Mr. Desjardins brought each of us one by one to his office for career counseling. I sat down across the desk from him, and he opened up a manila file folder with my name printed along its edge. It held much more than just my aptitude test, I could tell. You're a very strong student, Jessica, he said, closing the file to smile at me. I was the best student in my class. The year before, I'd switched to the English junior high program, and my class was bigger than Nicole's French program. But still, as I collected math and science tests, English and social studies assignments with 90s and 100s on them, I was confident that I'd have no trouble keeping ahead of her in math anymore. For the last year of elementary school, we'd been neck and neck. Have you ever considered becoming a teacher? Mr. Desjardins asked. I thought of my mom, of her stiff politeness when we ran to the other students' parents in town. I thought of the marking she often brought home to finish after supper. I thought of my classmate, Brian Mason, who balled up little bits of paper and threw them at teachers' backs until they became red-faced and sputtering. No, I replied. What about a nurse? Do you think you might want a career when you're finished school? I remembered Mr. Clayton at the dinner table. The easy confidence in his voice when he'd said that natural gas power plants were the future. I thought about my mom telling me I could be anything I wanted. You're smart enough, she'd said. I want to be an engineer, I replied. Mr. Desjardins smiled. It was the kind of smile I'd seen adults give to little kids who say they want to marry their brother or become an astronaut when they grow up. Well, good for you, he replied. There aren't many lady engineers, I don't think. And you'll have to study very hard. I will. He sent me back to class and told me to send the next student in. Ah, so frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we want to be a lady engineer, I suppose. <laughs> so, do you have anything you're working on now? Yeah, um, I've been working, well, I, I, I put in a lot of work last summer on a draft of, of essentially a road trip novel. Um, yeah, two sisters and their mom, and it's a bit complicated. That sounds so good! <laughs> I, I love a road trip book. I love sisters. I love the mom. I, lo I love female friendship and relationships in general. Just so much fun to read. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I can't wait for that. Do you have any idea like when it might be coming out or is it not at the point where oh would gosh know? um i'm about two-thirds away of the way through a first draft so um i guess it depends on when i can finish that first draft and get it out there yes as quick as you can okay and do you have, do you have any appearances you're doing for this book that we should know about oh um nothing scheduled right now um if i'm honest um public appearances freak me out quite a bit i love you know comfy little sound booths but uh yeah me out in public uh, talking about about me makes me very uncomfortable. I, I will be on a stage for days talking about anything or anybody else. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so just listen to the podcast over and over <laughs> Please again. Please listen to the podcast a lot. <laughs> Some There Are Fearless by Becca Babcock is available now everywhere books are sold. And thank you for listening and hanging out with us. Join me next time on this book lover's journey as we try to read more, read Canadian, read local. You know, all the good things. <laughs>